Hello, and welcome to The Next Great Car Era, a podcast by EV Tuners. I'm your host, Daniel Martin, and today I'm joined by Kevin Erickson, or as some may know him from social media, Mr. Mopar Man. Kevin is the builder of the Electrolyte, a 1972 Plymouth satellite powered by a Tesla large drive unit. Kevin has always been a classic muscle fan, especially of Mopars. He even still has his first car that he got at 14, a 69 Dart GT, which is currently running a turbocharged 340. After finally getting a B-body Plymouth satellite, Kevin set his eyes on an EV swap as a way to make big power and dive into a new frontier of technical possibilities. We cover all that and more right now. Enjoy. So um, let's see. We've had some really good conversations, but now that we're here recording, how about a little bit of intro and background for those folks who may maybe don't know you yet? Yeah, so I guess in this uh, latest um, realm that I've joined, uh, I built the Electrolyte, so uh, I wanted to dip my toes into the EV world, and um, there was a, a number of ways I could have done it. I could have bought a Tesla, uh, but I, I actually don't drive that much. I didn't really need a car. Mm. So, um, but I'm also, I've always been a hot rodder, a tinkerer, um, gearhead, just into everything. So, so yeah, I just thought the best way to learn about electric cars is to, to build one. And, uh, then I was able to learn all the ins and outs and, and really see if I wanted, uh, an electric car cause I hadn't driven one before. And so this was, uh, just all in one. And so now here we are. I guess it went well. It did go well. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, during the project, I had a lot of, uh, questions, uh, w whether I was doing the right thing or not, uh, as I was, uh, stumped, uh, a number of times, but now all said and done. Yeah. I love EVs. Um, I've got my cyber truck on order, you know, I'm, I'm full in now. Awesome. Cyber truck. Yeah. Do they give you guys any, any privileged information about when the, that's going to release yet? No, um, not the only thing I know is later this year, they're going to, uh, they intend to start production. They're building the assembly line, hiring people, but, uh, just like anybody else, I'm just reading what I can find on the internet and YouTube. Yep. That same. I'm really interested in, in grabbing one up as well when they're released, but it's been a tough wait, man. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting how they did that. They tested the waters, like, let's throw it out there. Maybe everyone would have hated it. And, um, it's such a wild design, but uh, then going just based on the orders and that's enough for them to spend the money on the infrastructure to get it done. It was, it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I feel like that's just another example. Uh, this is getting a little less, but three or four years ago, all of the major companies were saying, Oh, there's no demand for electrics. We, we can't make them cause there's no demand, but really there's nothing on the market. And now sure. everything that, uh, that comes out, like just, just looking at trucks, you have the, the Rivians, the Cybertruck, the Ford lightning, EV Silverado, and they're all back ordered like over yeah. a year. So I guess there's no demand, but, uh, right. oh, I know <laughs> if you build it, they will come. I think so. Especially when they're pretty badass. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, uh, you mentioned like some of the trials and tribulations. Uh, one thing you meant you talked to me about uh, when we were last uh, chatting it was really struck me as words of wisdom and kind of the global approach to getting into projects, maybe forging into the unknown. And um, could you talk a little bit about that? I, I just thought it was really poignant. Yeah. Um, so you know, my background as a gearhead and always learning something new, tinkering with something new that really stems from my, my parents and my father who, um, he's a gearhead. Uh, he just knows how to do everything. He's one of those guys. He just, you hand him something, he'll figure out what it is, how to fix it, what to do with it. And, um, so taking that further, when I was getting into things that maybe he wasn't even into, he and my mom both gave me the confidence of, you know, what you can do it, you know, if I was stumped or, or didn't know what to do, uh, I better call somebody, you know, who's the expert on this? Who, who do I find to do this? And they said, well, they weren't always the expert, you know, if they can do it and figure it out, then you can figure it out. And, 
And that's always stuck with me every time I get stumped. Uh, and I want to call somebody who doesn't want help, you know, like, yeah. you know, who, who, who can I call right now? And um, that always rings in my head, like, all right, they can figure it out. I think I can figure this out. I love that. That's really inspirational. Yeah, it's, uh, I should have had this in my garage, but the other thing that w- would um, hit me while I'm there alone uh, trying to figure this stuff out is there's no one coming. Like there is no <laughs> one to call. Uh, I'm on my own. So uh, not only was it motivational, it was just uh, the necessity. It's it's how it had to be. This stuff is really tip of the spear. Yeah, in a lot of ways. Um, now, there's been a number uh, of people who have done it before me, and I have to give credit to um, you know, Matt uh, Haber at Stealth EV, he's been doing this a long time um, on his own now. And then EV West, mm-hmm. there's other builds that I really liked um, from Zero EV in the UK. They built a Skyline with the drive unit. Uh, the yeah. Tesla was really neat. Um, Tesla Bimmer, all, all these guys that, you know, they started before me and I really uh, was inspired by what they did and mm-hmm. then uh, wanted to do it on my own. So let's talk a little bit about that satellite and when when you got it and what led to the decision to EV swap it. Yeah, so the satellite, uh, this car in particular, whether it was a Roadrunner, a GTX or a satellite, I've just always loved this body style. It's a and great I, body style. Yeah, it was um, it was a take it or leave it type of body back in the day um, because, you know, the big square chiseled muscle cars had been the staple for so long. And then Mm -hmm. when they departed and went to this fuselage body, um, a lot of people didn't warm up to it right away. And so not a lot of them got built. Um, A lot were scrapped. It just wasn't one of those hold on to forever cars. Um, But I saw it in uh, Dukes of Hazzard. Uh, I was a Dukes of Hazzard kid growing up and Daisy Dukes car. Yeah. So um, for some reason, it just, it was, I loved it as much as all the other um, B-body Mopars. So I finally found this one on Craigslist and it took me a year to buy it. Uh, yeah, I kept seeing the picture of it and it was all disassembled. Um, it had just been painted and I contacted the seller. And as soon as he realized I was serious, he, he had a change of heart and he's like, you know what? I can't. <laughs> and th- this was his father's car. His dad bought it brand new. Wow. Drove it back and forth between Nebraska and Colorado dozens of times. And, um, I think his dad had passed on. And so now he was, uh, restoring it because it was just a, it was a daily driver, you know, 150,000 miles on it. Um, it ran its course. Um, so six months pass, I try again, uh, again, we couldn't make a deal. Um, so it was a full year from the first time I saw it, I finally bought the car. Um, and I was just excited. You know, I just, I, I didn't have a full plan yet. I, I liked a hot rod. I wanted power. But just having the car was the first big step. Um, and th- this was well before I was um, planning on electric building anything. It was just, uh, it was going to be a turbo small block, maybe a turbo big block or Gen 3 Hemi. It was going to be something cool. with lots of boost, lots of power. Hmm. Has that uh, previous owner, are you still con- in contact with them? Have they seen what you did with it? I don't know. I tried to contact him and I don't know if I still have good um, phone number for him, but Uh I was a little nervous because he wanted to sell me a 440. He was going to build it. uh, It was an original 318 two barrel car. Yeah. um, Just a, just a cruiser. Mm -hmm. And uh, he tried to sell me the 440 with it. And um, I couldn't afford that at the time, uh, which would have been a great option. I mean, a big block Mopar, you just can't go wrong there. But um, I was, so I'm a little bit nervous what what he thinks I did to the car. (laughs) Yeah, I mean that 440 was his dream though, and and this is your dream, and uh, I don't know. I think it's pretty cool, but it it can be polarizing. But maybe that's how you know you're doing something right. Yeah, that's that's true. Uh, so we're gonna get into the technical details and and stuff on this, but I'd like to just fast forward. Like the build is mostly done. What what are, what does it look like now? What's the current specs? How is it to drive? Yeah. So uh, first off, it's my daily driver. If I'm going somewhere, that's the car I'm going to take. Nice. My my wife, uh, she's um, how I judge projects and success in a lot of ways, because she is supportive, but detailed and critical when she needs to be. And Hmm. so for her to want to take the car is a huge win. (laughs) And um, Oh, that's great. Yeah. I've built so many things that are, you know, on the 
sketchy side of things and, and uh <laughs> we may or may not make it home um or we may be late you know but um this car she trusts and uh we take it so the family can go so it's the daily car um it's a summer tire car so not in snow but any other weather we will take it and uh it's a it's kind of a car that tesla didn't build it's a p100 uh so it it all the parts came from a P100D ludicrous car. Okay. But I, I didn't use the front motor. So rear wheel drive, um, initially no traction control. I just wanted um, muscle car uh, that was reliable and I could drive. And mm. so that happened. And it's um, I can drive it as light as you want to drive or it's ready to you know punish you uh, if, if you want to. It's just like a Tesla. Uh, but it looks like the cars I like and grew up with, you know, the muscle car. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's more than what I hoped and, and, and being able to actually put the miles on it is a big win. What about, uh, track days? Have you taken it to the strip or anything like that? Yeah, not as much as I want to. Um, I've been to the Holly high voltage event. Uh, they've had it twice now at Sonoma raceway in uh, California, and so I've taken it down the drag strip. It's a low 12 second car. Um, the That's way fast. I set it up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good. Um, I think it can go, go high 11s and maybe there's more into it. I, on those days, I didn't know the car as well as I do now. And I didn't mm. know the EVs as well as I do now. So um, I've never taken it to hundred percent charge. I've never heated the batteries as hot as they can go. There's, there's a few little things that I think I can get, get out of it. That's interesting. Dialing it in just like uh, just like an ice car. If you're going to try and post a really good quarter, there's there's tweaking and dialing it in that isn't necessarily what you would do on the street. That's right. Yep, exactly. Um, there's and then all the basics work too. the the tires and tire pressure and um, getting your launch just right, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So then um, Going back to the beginning of the build, I, you kind of told me there's been some iterations on this. So can we start at the beginning and talk about the hardware and the software that you were using and kind of that that initial initial vision? Yeah. Um, so making the transition in my mind from an ICE vehicle, uh, turbocharged, high boost, thousand horsepower, that that was my mindset. And then mm -hmm. when I decided, you know, I, I want to try this electric uh, stuff out um picking the right parts was the initial um challenge and so this is when i called uh matt hobber at stealth ev and we talked um about different options and i knew that if i was going to build a muscle car mopar i better do it right it can't just be a, a low power cruiser right uh, it, it needs to you know speak the way it, it looks and so um we looked at uh high-end aftermarket brand new racing motors um but then ended up settling on the the tesla model s and there was a, a number of ways to to run that motor uh some people had some controllers out there um everything from solder your own motherboard together um with some op open uh source information um damien mcguire he makes a, a card and um you can have it assembled you can assemble it yourself I used an iteration of that, um, which came from the UK and uh, Matt supported at the time. And so it's swapping out basically the the controller inside the inverter. Uh, you take out the Tesla mm -hmm. control board, you, you install this in the inverter, and now it's a completely open source tunable inverter. And uh, it works, you know, guys, guys have these cars going and there's a number of them out there. And it was uh, it was really a, a challenge to to get it running. The first time I took the car out after wiring everything up and using this control board, it came it shipped completely detuned, um, which it turns out was a good idea because when I took it around the block, I still had the hood sitting on the roof of the car. You know, um, it, <laughs> it was the the day the wheels turned, I was so excited. I, I thought, oh, man, I got to get it out of the garage. And so I, I pushed it in the driveway or I rolled it in the driveway under its own power. And um, my neighbor who'd seen me working on this car for uh, quite some time, he said, well, we got to go for a ride. So no seats, no interior, no hood other than sitting <laughs> on a blanket. And we, <laughs> we drive it around the block 
And thank goodness it didn't make power because I would have driven right up out from under that hood. It would have just like a cartoon just stayed in place. You just forgot it like a coffee cup on the top. It was it didn't even cross my mind. I have no idea why. <laughs> um, this is why my my wife questions my judgment, you know, these type of decisions. Uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, I've got some security camera footage of it driving off. Oh, uh, that's good. Yeah. But the, so the inverter made no power. I went seven miles an hour. It only, okay. it put like 10 amps of, of power down. So um, thank goodness. Otherwise, yes. it was body work on the hood. <laughs> but then I had to figure out how to tune it. And there was very little guidance on tuning that other than uh, forums mm -hmm. and uh, a little bit from, the manufacturer, um, but no detail. They just said, be careful. These numbers, small numbers, small changes make a big difference in the inverter. So you're, you're dealing with, uh, the boost of the field and you're, you're making adjustments down to tenths of Hertz. And one adjustment causes a, a ripple effect over three, four, five, six other adjustments. And so it was very slow and time consuming to get any power out of it. And I didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing totally. So I didn't go too far and burn something up. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, slowly it, it started to work. I started to make some great power with it. Awesome. Tenths of Hertz. That is, that is like pretty minute adjustments. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't even know what the setting meant, you know, like I'm looking up these numbers and, and under the, the heading they used um, and then, it was all trial and error. Like, okay, I'm going to change this one setting, one tenth of a hertz, and drive it. And then you would you would feel vibrations, um, jitters. You know, when he was first tipping the the accelerator, and I would feel very small changes. And so, just by feel and keeping track of what I did, one small adjustment at a, at a time, it started to make sense. And like, just for perspective, like, how many settings are you are you looking at? You're you're doing moving it a tenth on one setting out of like a hundred, two hundred. Um, I think overall there there could be close to a hundred, but the the ones that made the difference, I'm looking at uh, ten or less probably um, in, in the range of the drivability and the power. Uh, there were some other settings that were kind of uh, upper and lower limits and uh, initial mm -hmm. configurations, but uh, as far as the real tuning, I would say it was about ten or less. Okay. And is this the uh, the board that you had to to tune? You would basically connect over Wi-Fi and and reflash it, or is that later down the road? Yeah, so this was the Wi-Fi board, um, which was is smart. Um, they just put a, a Wi-Fi chip on the card itself, but it's inside the inverter, which is inside an aluminum can, an aluminum housing, which is underneath the car. So the reception was not that great. So yeah. It wasn't like uh, plugging in my laptop on a on a Holly EFI and and making the the tuning happen um, on a very polished system. This was getting out and getting underneath the car where I had enough reception and it was a web page uh, uh, based um, tuning application. So you're just mm. using HTML and uh, making the changes there and then saving it them and and then verifying they saved. So it was slow. It was a slow time-consuming process, which was really par for the course. The, the entire project kind of went that way. Yeah. So did you get that through that process? Did you get it like fully drivable, dailyable, take it on trips, charge, that sort of stuff? Yeah. So the car was driving good and I was to the point where I was trying to uh, squeeze every bit of horsepower out of it. Um, I was working on launch control, which was really cool on that. The, the, the beauty of the tunable software and cards is that you can tweak all those those things for to maximize and and the um the drive on this setup and this goes back to why i chose it mm -hmm. you, can, you can push more amperage through the motor than you can with the the stock tesla unit and so um yeah it was drivable uh, i couldn't get the the tip in on the pedal especially in reverse it, it had a lot of vibration a lot of stutter and this is talked about on all the forums, people working on that could never get it buttery smooth. Um, hmm. But the launch control was working really good. Um, you would hold the brake and just pin the pedal to full full pedal. And what you could do is ramp in the power to the limit of the traction that the car has. So being only rear wheel drive, 
setting up my shocks, getting a good uh, weight transfer on the tires I have on the street, I could build this ramp and it would just launch without any slip, without any traction control. And uh, it, it was really getting there. Um, and I should uh, get to the point here too. Um, I ended up blowing up the inverter and I don't know exactly if it was my <laughs> doing or if it's just uh, one of the weaknesses of that particular board, but I went probably the best launch I've done. It, it launched so hard. It's the traction just stuck. Um, but when that happens, you accelerate so quick, like any electric car that you have to get out of it and slow back down. So when I went from full launch into regen, yeah, I, I heard my power pyro fuse blow and that was the end of that inverter. Oh, well, at least it, there's a good story to its death, I suppose. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so then what'd you do? Uh, you kind of fork in the road, right? That inverter's yeah. done. What next? Inver and I didn't know initially what I thought I'd blew a fuse. Can you just blow a fuse? I don't know. Maybe I, I hit a limit and I blew the fuse. So I, I swapped that out initially and that wasn't it. So then pulled the motor out of the car pull the inverter off. I, I could see it actually burned, you know, uh, char, char marks. I let the smoke out and that you can't put that back. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, Matt from stealth, he, he helped me out, found another, um, uh, sport inverter and, uh, I just swapped it out. And, uh, so now are you still using the same, the same controller for that? I, I decided to change direction and, okay. um, the other way to do it, which I think is a more reliable way to do it, but still have good power, is to just use the stock Tesla board. And it's controlled by an intermediate controller that uses CAN to, um, when I say I want full power, it tells the, the Tesla tune that it wants full power and you mm -hmm. get it. Um, there's some people who don't quite like that uh, route. You know, you're kind of using a middleman to control things. But from what I can tell, it is such a good tune. And if you think about me self-taught, you know, using Wi-Fi on an inverter with settings I've never heard of versus Tesla engineers who not only designed and built it, but have millions and millions of miles of data and tuning it, that's kind of the difference in, in how crisp and how perfect the tune is. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it doesn't seem like it's that different than than some of the tuning in ICE cars, where there's different ways you could do a full standalone ECU. You could do something more like a piggyback solution, where you're you're kind of like faking out some of the signals to then control it. Um, so there's different ways to get there. Yeah, that's true. You yeah, know, I, the 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 drivability alone, um, I, I'm willing to give up a little bit of the power because the drivability is so good. But no launch control anymore? No launch control. Um, you know, I can, uh, I guess I would call it power braking or brake boosted. So I can hold the brake pedal and then tip in just barely uh, with the pedal, but I can't do a full full throttle uh, and then release the brake type of launch control. So it's it's kind of old school, like you're um, loading up a, a torque converter. Yeah. Um, but it, it works great. It's so quick. I have a Model 3 and uh, maybe I just haven't figured it out yet, but uh, uh, the software gets mad at me if I try to uh, power boost, I'll, yeah. you know, go brake and then start easing in. And it gives me a message like, oh, did you know your, your foot's on the brake right now? And it just kills the power. I'm like, God, come on. <laughs> What's wrong with you driving with two feet? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> maybe there's a way to trick it. I haven't actually looked into that too much, but uh, someone might tell me, well, don't you know the setting? Come on. <laughs> you know there i met a guy at sonoma raceway and he drag races his model 3 performance um weekly he's been driving it you know for for years now and uh he made a an electronic timer um so he can dial in his et you know um down to the hundredth of a second for consistency and he wins every week um he beat me at the track and oh, it cool. wi wired it into his uh, the accelerator pedal on that car. And so there's some electronics. Some guys are figuring some stuff out there. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool. I'll have to uh, I'll have to find out more about that and uh, and chat with him next time. Maybe he'll be at Holly again. Yeah, yeah. He's been there both times. Great guy. 
So we talked a little bit about the tuning process that that you've been through. Anything else that that maybe was surprising about tuning an EV, whether it's like totally different than the other things that you've tuned over the years, or maybe like surprisingly similar? You know, um, it's when you when you look at it from outside, it, it seems complicated, kind of like somebody uh, like my dad's generation who could tune a carburetor with a screwdriver in his ear and he would just have a car purring, you know, mm -hmm. um, and then looking at that and saying, oh, EFI, that's complicated. Um, and that's kind of what electric cars are. The, there's magic there that you can't really figure out initially. Um, but then it comes down to it and it's actually uh, much more simple. Um, there's a lot of wires with the battery pack and the battery management, but the, the tuning in the car is still just a car. Um, and it's even more simple when you just use the Tesla tune. So, um, in my mind now, um, you just buy a, a wrecked car and you have everything you need, um, for the most part, other than the aftermarket controller. So it, I would say it's, um, I'm pleasantly surprised how simple everything is. It's it's harder to go get an LS out of the junkyard and wire it up and and swap into a, an old Chevelle or a you know a Tri Five Chevy. I, I would be much more willing to do the EV again over going back to the ICE just because of the simplicity. Oh, interesting. What about the uh, what about the hardware side? You know, to the LSs, there's motor mounts for for pretty much anything you want, but that's not the case with something like a Tesla swap. Uh, how did you get that motor in into the the satellite? Yeah, that's um, that is a big piece of the puzzle. And choosing the right car for what you want to build, it turns out makes a big difference. Mm. Um, I already had the car. Uh, luckily, old Mopars are big fat cars, and so. <laughs> Um, Teslas are big fat cars, even yeah. the model three, it's a good sized car. The model S is extremely wide. Yeah. Uh, so I was able to fit the entire subframe out of the Tesla inside my factory metal fender flares because the car is so big. Really? Wow. Yeah, and, and that was a huge win in my mind Yeah. Uh, because I didn't have to re-engineer any other suspension or anything that way. Yeah. A lot of guys have to do like totally custom subframes to get those in and then build the body out because it flares out more than it should. And it's possible, but that starts getting to be pretty extensive fabrication. Yeah. And if, if you compare, uh, the satellite to say Teslanda, which I love, they made it look like an old gasser. That's the full subframe, but the wheels hang out six, eight inches on either side because uh, that's a small Honda Accord. Mm -hmm. Um, and it didn't, didn't quite fit, but you get the big fat cars, um, anything from a, a B body Mopar to anything bigger. Um, I know someone building a Lincoln continental, it'll just swallow it up cause that's a big car. So, um, using a big car, it's very straightforward. I made four motor mounts. Uh, the subframe in the Tesla is just four big bolts, four 14 millimeter bolts. And that's it. That's all that's holding it in there. Um, and so uh, making four mounts in a big car was, was very straightforward. Um, nearly as easy as buying an LS motor mount for a car. Not quite a little bit of fabrication work, but, but still straightforward. Not so bad. Right. And I think that conventional wisdom, um, from, from the people who had, you know, the, the original tip of the spear when maybe 20 years ago, people were doing like DC builds, forklift motors, things like that. It had to be light. And a lot of that was because of the battery weight, which is still a big consideration. But with lithium batteries, it's gotten a little bit better. And I think builds like the old, these Mopars and, and classic muscle is actually possible for the first time. Yeah, that's true. Batteries was everything. Um, I had thought about doing a build. I, I came across a, a forklift motor. It was an AC motor. And I thought, what can I put this in? And my brother-in-law had an old uh, Eclipse and I thought, well, that'll be cool. And I started doing math on batteries and weight, just like you said. And not only can you not get that much voltage using just lead acid batteries, you need so many of them. Yeah. That, uh, the weight just stacks up and then they don't have that good a range. You know, they, they don't, can, they don't hold a lot of power. So it just wasn't worth the effort back then. The, the, the lithium batteries is, is everything. So what did, what does your battery solution look like for the satellite? 
So I used a full Tesla 100 kilowatt hour pack. So um, the the Model S comes in in 16 modules for a 100, um, as well as the the 90 and the 85. And initially, I thought an 85. And this is this goes back to me not knowing a lot of details. And I mm-hmm. thought, oh, 85. I see those online. Um, and then, but Matt Haber at Stealth, he he knows the details, the voltage sag, uh, the difference in having more cells in parallel. And so um, he thought I should do a 90 pack, which had a little bit higher current or higher capacity per cell or a 100. But at the time, 100s were just not very common. And uh, he called me out of the blue one day. I had already had the, I had the motor. I was waiting to to last for the battery because that's the biggest expense uh, as well as the biggest part and the weight and assembly and everything else. Sure. Um, and he said, I found a 100 pack. Uh, it's got low miles. I think you should buy it. And so um, he talked me into it. I, I did it. And uh, it was the way to go for a number of reasons. Yet it's still a limitation for the car. Um, so the, the 100 kilowatt hour pack has more cells in parallel than an 85 or 90. So you have um, better uh, use of the space. So they were able to pack, um, instead of 444 cells per module, it's 512. So you get, you're just getting, you're adding more cells. So that's more okay. weight. But you have, when you have more cells in parallel, you have a stiffer pack. You know, when you draw, draw amperage from that pack, they will all get voltage sag, but the more you have in parallel, it'll sag less or maybe um, not as quickly. So you can run full power longer. So starting to realize some of these um, characteristics of the battery pack as it relates to making power, the 100 made the most sense at the time and I could fit it in the car. Uh, Tesla, of course, has it underneath the car. It's a big pack all their cars that that bolt in uh from the bottom yeah i think i couldn't do i could do that but i was unwilling to cut the car i was still at the stage where i'm going to make this bolt in in case it doesn't work and i can go back and put that 440 back in it <laughs> <laughs> so uh what i was able to do is just re- repackage the batteries um and those batteries work well for that because being in modules and 16 of them you can turn them on side uh rotate them 90 degrees you know put them on edge however you want to do it and so i I built three total boxes i've got 10 under the hood six more in the trunk which is also good for weight distribution you can spread the weight out around the car um what it did for me is having the the motor in the rear with some batteries in the rear i've got 55 percent rear weight in this car that used to be 60 to 65 percent front weight um, with a big block in it. So it totally changed the car for the better. Yeah. That's kind of perfect. Yeah. So voltage sag, um, I'm not familiar with that. Maybe everyone listening is, but, um, is that basically like, like, uh, when you start discharging battery, it's going to come be, you know, put out a lot of power really quick, but then it kind of like tapers off. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, um, and, and you have to protect the batteries because if you just short a battery, it's just going to give you all the current it can and, and until it can't anymore. Um, but we don't want to do that. We want these batteries to last a long time. And so this is where battery management comes into play. And also the the tune on that Tesla inverter board. So um, what happens, and I've graphed this, uh, which is really interesting, The you go full power the motor will draw as much current as it can handle. So in my case, it's 1200 amps. It just pulls 1200 amps. And if you watch what happens to the battery, it immediately starts to drop in voltage. Um, So if my battery pack, uh, like any Tesla, started at full charge, 400 volts, Mm -hmm. it will immediately taper down. Now you'll you'll be able to still draw current as that uh, voltage tapers down. But when it gets to a, a bottom limit, which is about 300 volts, then the motor will start uh, reducing the current it's asking for in order to protect that battery pack and not take the voltage any lower. And this comes down to the cell level, the single 18650 cell in my case, or 2170 in your case, it has battery specs from the manufacturer. So if this is a Panasonic cell, they have all this data, you know, it's got a, a temperature range, a voltage range, and um, it all varies based on the state of charge as well. 
but that when that voltage sag happens and it decides to reduce current to protect the battery pack, you're reducing horsepower. Got so, it. Yeah. Uh, the advantage, we all know the electric cars, instant torque, right? Instant mm -hmm. horsepower. Um, the torque for sure, when you hit full, full throttle, you hit the peak torque of the motor instant. So in, in my case, it's 442 pound feet of torque coming off the motor. It's instantly 442. It's a straight line until we hit that voltage sag, that lower limit, and then it starts reducing current. Your your torque starts to drop off um, at the same pace. What are you, how are you graphing this? How, do you have some, are you running software or is it part of that controller that you're able to like actually harvest data? Yes, you can data log um, from that controller. And it's it's from EV controls. It's called the T2C. It's their second generation. Uh, they have a, an iPad or iPhone app. And on that app, you can just turn on data log and it'll data log uh, all of the parameters that you can pull out of the motor. And so I isolated it down to uh, torque and then current um, along with battery voltage. And then you can calculate horsepower based on the RPM and um all i just wanted the basic gearhead stuff yeah what is the power looking like where can i make more power that's pretty cool i i, I would imagine it's easy to get lost in looking at that data after a, a fun day of driving yeah it's, it's really fun though you know like anything you look at it first and you're just cross-eyed you, you yeah. know looking at that. Um, <laughs> but you start to isolate some of the data and you see the patterns and when I put it into graphical form with just four basic um, lines. So uh, voltage, amperage, horsepower, and torque, and you can see the relationships mm. and it starts to come together. And then you wonder, all right, is it because of the voltage that there was a limit or did I over temp the motor? Because there's also temperature limitations. Um, Model S makes big, big time power, but it's, um, it's not immersion cooled. Uh, you don't have oil cooling in the stator. So those stator windings, um, it's only just heat sink. Uh, so like a Model 3 motor, actually you can abuse a Model 3 motor much more up to the permanent magnets, which you don't want to demagnetize. So there's a balance there, but it has much better cooling to protect those magnets. Um, if you did an immersion cooled uh, Model S motor, you could really push it, but um, other than that, there's nothing to demagnetize or anything. You're just worried about the the shielding on the windings in the motor is is really the limitation of the temperature. So there is an upper limit, but I haven't hit that limit because on a on a muscle car, a street fighter, or you know, occasional drag car, you're on the power for 10, 12 seconds and it doesn't have time to sink in and, and start to do damage. That makes sense. Uh, I didn't know that about the difference between the Model S and Model 3 uh, motor, so that's pretty interesting. Yeah, and, I, and so the Plaid, you know, went to more of the Model 3 architecture um, and, and some other things too, you know, higher RPM, higher voltage, but um, which is the way to go. That's my next uh, drive. If I'm going to build a hot rod, it's got to be, you know, going towards the, the Plaid power or just multiple motors. Yeah, that would be cool too. So back to batteries uh, real quick, the, uh, um, the battery management. So you have 10 in the front, six modules in the back, uh, batteries and EVs. There's a couple, I mean, there's this interrelationship between the cooling system and the batteries and the motor and even climate control. We didn't talk if you have AC or heater, but it's all, sometimes it's all the same loop, right? With, and there's heat exchangers and you can take take uh heat from the battery to heat the cabin you uh, if you need cooling for the battery pack then it might cut ac or send some some heating or cooling back to the engine uh and it's all about for the batteries keeping them in their optimal operating specs but and and protecting them and we talked about protecting them with that voltage uh draw a little bit so what are you doing for battery management yeah, so this is um, the single biggest challenge in a conversion. Um, Tesla has this figured out, but it's not just plug and play. When I disassembled that pack, I'm just down to basic components now. Mm -hmm. um, so I started to put a lot of thought in this ahead of time. And the first step was how do I control valves and pumps uh, to run through those heat exchangers um, and have it tunable for me and... Um, 
obtainable, I guess. So what I looked at is using a PDU, which is a power distribution unit. I used one from Holly or Racepack. Uh, they bought Racepack. It's a 30 output wire harness. It's basically a programmable wire harness. Um, this worked out great because part of, part of what I like is I, I love technical details, but I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I'm not going to be writing code and apps and making big electronic complex components. So this is an off the shelf unit, the smart wire. I needed to wire the whole car anyway. So it becomes my whole fuse panel. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it, it does fuses, it does relays, it does switching, it does timing. You can use all kinds of inputs. Uh, so temperature inputs, um, other components being on, uh, there's a, it's basic logic. So if, if then else, um, you, you can program all of this stuff. So it's very basic as far as that goes. What I used that for was I need a, a temperature of the battery because I don't want to charge it when it's too cold, let's say. And this goes down to that cell date of the battery. I pulled the Panasonic cells. What are the limits of charging to keep this battery healthy? So I don't mm -hmm. charge under 10 degrees uh, Fahrenheit um, or uh, Celsius, I'm sorry, um, 10 degrees Celsius or above 45 degrees. And uh, but you can discharge, you know, negative 20 to positive 60. So these are the overall limitations. And now how do you take that and make it um, longevity? Where do you get the longevity or where do you get the best range out of the battery? So I started pulling data from um, charging. So like a better route planner, it has all these charge curves and temperature curves that um, people have logged and they've, they've got this data. So I started looking at Tesla cars versus other cars. And mm. what I what I got it down to is I just keep my batteries between 25 and 35 degrees Celsius. And that's all the time. Um, you can run it colder and maybe there's an efficiency gain there temporarily, but you're going to get the most energy density out of the battery if you keep it between 25 and 35. And it's also healthy. It's, you know, 80 degrees, let's say, which is what I want to be all the time. So um, it's just comfortable for the battery. Now to do that, um, there's a number of ways to switch and configure the batteries. Um, there's a heater in the loop. So the, the coolant flows through all of the battery modules equally. They're all in parallel. So they all get an equal temperature in and out of these modules. And each module has a temperature sensor in it that I can monitor, but I also have an overall return temperature in the loop. And so that goes into the Holly smart wire based on ranges on that temperature, I'll either turn on the heater. Uh, so if it needs to get it up to at least 25 degrees Celsius, heater comes on and it, once that return loop temperature hits that, it'll switch off the heater. Um, now, while you're heating, you don't want to run it through a radiator because you would just be wicking that heat right back off. So at any time it's heating, it's bypassing the radiator. Mm -hmm. And, and so you're keeping it just in a closed loop. And I got to say, most of the time it's in closed loop almost almost all weather um most of the year where i live in in denver it's in closed loop either heating or just circulating when you do get to the summer days then you might uh open up that three-way valve flow it through the radiator get some passive cooling or when charging if i'm charging in warm weather um it'll it'll passively cool or kick on uh, a coolant fan uh, on the radio. So there's multiple stages, multiple levels of this temperature reading. Yeah. Um, so let, let's say I get up to 35 degrees Celsius while I'm charging. We'll go ahead and pass it through the radiator. If it starts to get up to 40 degrees, let's kick on the fan, keep it under control. If it gets above that, we reconfigure again. Now we go back in the radiator bypass, the air conditioner kicks on and it sprays Freon through a, um, a heat exchanger that is now chilling the battery loop. And that'll keep it under control, which is really important, especially fast charging. Um, um, and, and that's all Tesla parts. So it's a Tesla heat exchanger. I just had to wire it into my system to make it work. And all that control is done with that Holly smart wire. Wow, that's pretty sophisticated. But but once it's set, it's kind of like set it and forget it a little bit. You put the parameters in there and you're good to go. That's right. Yep. And it's it's updatable. So because the all this wiring... You have the hard wiring that goes to the hard parts, but now I can reconfigure based on temperatures, or maybe I learned something I wasn't aware of, mm -hmm. and I'll make some adjustments. Or like race mode, um, if I put a switch in there, now it gets this input, 
Now disregard all my programming and just hit a higher temperature, hit 45 degrees Celsius so I can get, uh, so I can drop the resistance of the batteries, get more of that voltage to the motor, which is again, Tesla has figured all this out. I'm just making it work for my application. Sure. Yeah. Is that switch in the uh, future? Do you think? Oh no, I already have it. It's you already have it. Switch. Yeah. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. I just haven't used it yet. I need to go out there and heat these batteries up and give it a whirl. Oh, uh, sounds like a plan. I don't know what we're doing talking right now. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, what a cool build. Um, and, uh, I know I'm looking forward to seeing it in person again and, uh, and and what's next i'd like to switch gears a little bit um and talk about the ev community and how you found that to be you know, you've mentioned a lot of support from stealth ev and other other folks who have kind of helped with this build but then there's other people who have electric cars and you've been going to holly i think didn't you did you go to state of charge last year also yes yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's close to me that's just down the road um so Terry, who put that on, great guy. What a great idea. And everybody yeah. loved it. I'm hoping to go this year. Very um, cool. And uh, But yeah, so what's the EV community like? So I've kind of got the EV community and the car community broken down into four categories now. Um, and uh, I, I'm learning more about the different the different groups. Um, yeah. One is the, the anti-EV guys, and that's that's probably what I would have been pinned down as if you knew me before, because, you know, compound turbo diesels that smoke and um, my dart is turbocharged and all V8 cars. And I, I really do want to be green. I used to run diesel on cooking oil, you know, to try to displace some diesel, but also I, I fly airplanes and I burn a ridiculous amount of jet fuel. So I, I realize I'm not green, even though I want to be, um, so if you looked at me from the outside, you'd say I'm anti-EV, I'm anti-green. <laughs> and, and there are those folks out there. That, so that is one side of it. Um, I've gotten a lot of uh, hate mail and uh, death threats and, it, you know, subtle. Oh, my subtle, gosh. Um, uh, on, on messing up old cars. So there's there's those guys. Okay. But then, then there's um, guys just like me who are hot rodders and just want to go fast. And that's really the community of car guys I, I found. Um, there's a great, uh, friend of mine in, in Salt Lake and up in Idaho. And these guys, we've, we've been gearheads and now we're mm -hmm. just doing it in a different way. That's all it is. You can make horsepower with it, with batteries. Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, and, and then there's the green car builders who are doing it because they want to be green and that's great. Um, you know, there's a lot of cool cars you can bring back on the road and they are way more efficient. Um, I mean, the Plymouth is way more efficient. It's a hot rod, but it gets the equivalent of a hundred miles per gallon. So, I mean, it, it's ridiculous. Not bad. Yeah. So that's the pure drive for some folks is I want this old classic, but I, I'm just doing it because it's green and, um, and that's a great way to go. And then there's the, the people who are just getting into cars. Maybe they had small hybrids before, but they're, they're driving Teslas and, and bolts and, um, leafs because they are very green cars they're super efficient and um and so these four categories have kind of um I, i'm bouncing into all these people now and um i fit more with the gearheads and the builders for horsepower but what what struck me the the most and this is just a, a one-off event i'm at a car charger and i get some funny looks because it's a big fat plymouth and there's a nissan leaf and there's a, a bolt and there's a uh, Model 3. And uh, the folks, they kind of, you know, tilt their head and they wonder if I'm one of these anti guys who's just icing the the charger because sure. I, I look totally out of place. And they come up and they, once they see it's plugged in, and, and I would categorize, categorize these folks as just, they want a new efficient car. They're not gearheads. They're not builders. Um, and uh, they get to talking. And once they realize it's a green car, all of a sudden they became car people. They started to see it mm. in a different light. Like, wow, this is, this is a cool car and it's green. And uh, so that was really um, entertaining for me. But, um, but my, my core community, I would say are these builders and the support is amazing. Um, I was just online yesterday and uh, one guy made a, a flywheel for another guy, you know, just because he knew he needed help. It, it's, it's kind of like the old days when racing was getting going, you go to the track. It doesn't matter if you're head to head, 
and you're cutthroat all the time, if someone needs a part, you're going to go find them that part so we can go back and, and race some more. I love that. And I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that it feels right now like we're we're in a time that fast forward 20 years is going to be the good old days, but we're here now. And I just am having a blast living it um, as we're kind of charting into this territory, going fast, ex- experimenting, breaking things, building things, figuring it out. It's uh, yeah. It's a ton of fun, man. Yeah, it is. It's great. The other thing that that I often think about is there's so much emphasis and focus on what motor or engine is in a car, but I think that there, like in many things in life, there's a lot more similarity between cars, uh, whether it's a ice car or an electric car, than there is different when you come at it from a perspective of car people. It's like you know, I I've been telling one, I'm excited. I'm going to Willow Springs later this, uh, later this month. And cool. there's going to be a bunch of people. I'm just starting to learn on my racing journey and everyone's going to go and know more than me. And most of them aren't going to be driving EVs, but I'm going to be like a sponge because there's so much race craft. There's so much knowledge about tire suspension, aerodynamics, driver skill it has nothing to do with EVs. So I think it's so cool that, uh, you know, regardless of that power plant, the knowledge and just the general car car people it it all kind of we're all helping each other out and learning and and there's a lot that applies yeah yeah for sure and that man every time i've seen an electric car out on the track autocross especially the the model three it just blows my mind i mean i've never seen cars just regular cars people drove the cars there and i've never seen a car push that hard it's it's unreal and um the gas guys are going to be learning from that too, you know, mm-hmm. so it's, it's mutually beneficial. I think. I hope so. Yeah. The first time I came really was looking at EVs from a performance standpoint um, was, you know, some years ago, I used to have an eclipse myself and it was the turbo all wheel drive. And there were rumors at the Super time. Cool. Uh, oh, totally fun when it was working. Um, okay. And there was rumors that the Evo was going to be hybrid and man, people had some things to say about that. But that was also, I was looking and F1 was doing Kerr's systems. And I'm like, well, you know, they can't be that wrong. And then Tesla comes on the board and it's like, oh, these things are fast. And uh, so now the rest is history because we have EVs that you can go and get in the car and, uh, and, and just put down some crazy numbers. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the little McMurtry, did you see that thing? Yeah. <laughs> Vacuums itself to the ground so you have more traction. I mean, it's it's unreal. That thing is insane. Yeah. yeah. It's super fast. Yeah. And and that's that's what's got me so excited. Like we are just getting going. Like there I'm just the guy who built a car in my garage. Wait till the big hot rodders and uh money back to guys start building some ridiculous hot rods and race cars. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. I I totally agree. So for you, what's next? Uh, so I've got a number of things. Um, I sort of just agreed to build a um, a DeLorean. And uh, this has been, uh, <laughs> it, it's been mentioned to me a couple of times. And I, I I wanted to build a shop first, uh, which is my long-term plan. I'm building a shop oh, and, sweet. Uh, to do more builds. But this one will be uh, built here at home again. And um, and I've got a bunch of it kind of waiting. A good friend of mine has a 70 Torino. So I, I started EV muscle cars. That's my background. That's where I want to be. I want to build big muscle cars. And so the 70 Torino, and then I've got a 55 Bel Air of my own that um, needs to be an all-wheel drive Model 3 car. Um, I'm just going to keep keep building with uh, mostly Tesla parts and keep learning. Um, I've been designing my own battery boxes to use different cells to get beyond the limitation of that voltage sag. If I can use stiffer batteries we can make more power for longer that will really change the performance the bet this the um the tesla batteries are awesome but they sag in voltage it, it's just a known known factor but if you go to a different cell uh we can make more power and so um exploring that and uh i'm just going to keep learning as much as i can i'll have uh links in the show notes for everyone to check out EV muscle cars and your different YouTube and Instagram and stuff like that. I'm excited uh, to see 
to see what you start doing there. It's particularly what you mentioned about different cells. Um, that is, that's interesting. That's real interesting. And the different pair ups, you know, I've seen people use a uh, volt modules for Tesla because yeah. they have different discharge characteristics, but they don't have the range that the Tesla cells do. But I can imagine that there's similar sorts of, uh, things you're exploring. Yeah. And that's, uh, to get back to the batteries real quick, that is how you have to choose, you know, do you want range? Do you want power, um, hybrid batteries, uh, from like the Volt, they have to have higher, uh, charge and discharge because it's a smaller battery pack, but it still has to put out good power and high voltage. And so the cell is designed for that, um, where the Tesla had the advantage of, well, we'll just use a whole bunch of cells mm. and we'll we'll still get that. But if you're going to make a small pack, so if you're going to do a lightweight, high performance car, you have to have much higher discharge, higher C rating on those cells. Um, I think there's a, a balance of much higher C rating, um, but also make a big pack and a big car. And so you can get both. And some of the numbers I put together, you can put, a, a large, a full size, 100 kilowatt hour battery pack together that would have just ridiculous output. You'd be able to make full power as long as your pedal is on the floor, which would be completely uh, impossible to uh, use unless you're doing land speed. Um, <laughs> but uh, it would be awesome for a street street fighter. Oh yeah. All right, sign me up, man. Yeah. <laughs> Any advice for people interested in building EVs or or getting in, involved? I think your advice from the beginning of if someone can do it, then so can you. I think that's huge. But any other any other thoughts? Yeah, there there are some um, ways to get knowledge um, out there um, beyond just the the forums and YouTube. You know, I, I tried to share what I could on YouTube. I'm not really a videographer or, or YouTuber to to say, but. Um, there's people, there's a lot of people like me putting what they have figured out out there, but then there's also like legacy EV and they have a whole training program. Yeah. So you can go to legacy EV and get certified as a, an EV builder. And that will give you the basic building blocks to, to learn from, um, state of charge. That was great. Um, myself and a bunch of other presenters, we, we got up and we talked about our whole uh build and you know with pictures and demonstration on, on how we did things then we had our cars there in person to check out so going to these events holly high voltage is great um and then myself uh, i like to read product manuals um and uh mm. i don't know when this started but um if you look at if you go to any training program you're going to get trained based on what was engineered and all the engineering, all that information's in the product manuals. So if you want to know how does a battery management system work, look up a battery management system, download the manual and read it until it starts to make sense. And then you can compare that to other manufacturers. Like what is the AEM versus the Orion? And it's free knowledge and it's out there. You can download it. You can get a whole education just by reading engineering product manuals. I love that. That's a really good suggestion. Not all of it makes sense. I still don't understand it, but at least you get something out of it, you know? Right, right. And I don't know, it's uh, osmosis a little bit. You force yeah. your mind to it. It's like the more you kind of look at something. I, I feel like I, while I haven't read product manuals, there's plenty of things I've researched. And uh, at first first glance, it's all, it's all alien, but the more you do it, then it starts clicking a little bit. And then, and then there's nothing in between. It's like, this doesn't make sense. And then all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, I'm actually, I, I know what I'm reading now. Uh, right. Kind of funny how it just clicks like that. Yeah. And then you start talking that way. And pretty soon you're <laughs> going to be using volt, voltage sag in your daily life. You know? <laughs> We're like, what are you talking about? All right. That's a challenge this week. <laughs> we got to try and drop voltage sag into a uh, normal conversation. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> right on, Kevin. Well, thanks so much for the time. I really appreciate you to uh, share in all of this knowledge. Super exciting stuff. And uh, look forward to seeing you in person at one of these events. Likewise. Yeah. Yeah. I love what you're doing. Uh, I can't wait to see all the builds people will come up with and um, just keep this community growing and building. It's awesome.